Hi class, it's Dr. Lindner, welcome back. We are on another interesting topic. Um, neurology is a very interesting topic. We're gonna look at some clinical conditions. So it's it's nice to know and interesting to know what the normal, what the brachial plexus is, and then what structures they innervate, and what muscles they go to. But it's also interesting to be able to observe people, right? And be able to look at people, see certain type of abnormalities or clinical conditions and to have an understanding as to, oh, I've learned this. Oh, I've seen this before. I think I know what this is. So let me uh, introduce you to some, a few common neurological conditions that you may see of the upper extremity. So uh, there's a little silly mnemonic that I want you to write down and it's called Dr. Kuma, Dr. Kuma. And wherever I'm putting the dots, the dots would represent the, the nerve, like R for radial nerve, U for ulnar nerve, and M for median nerve. And then the letter that is adjacent to it would be the clinical condition. So for example, R in radial nerve. In a previous video, I said, whenever you think of the radial nerve, I want you to think of extension. Whether it's extension at the elbow, extension at the wrist, extension at the fingers, the radial nerve controls extension. So if there's damage to the radial nerve, whether someone gave an injection at the shoulder region improperly or someone was wearing a tight cast or someone was on crutches and the crutches were jabbing somewhere in that armpit, uh, that creates a condition called wrist drop. So D for drop hand or drop wrist and the R for radial nerve. You can see that in this particular picture right here, this is called Herb's palsy or waiter's tip. And this one here is called wrist drop, but it's the same positioning. What's happening is that the radial nerve that controls wrist extension is damaged. So if you can't extend the wrist, if this doesn't work, then all the wrist flexors kick in, right? All the wrist flexors are engaged without any opposing extensor muscle that's engaged because it can't engage if the radial nerve is damaged. So that means you get this pulling of all the anterior muscles of the forearm and wrist and fingers creating a wrist drop, okay? Median nerve injury, so the M for median nerve injury, causes a condition called ape hand. So if there is median nerve damage, all of these muscles that go to the thumb, which are called thenar muscles or thenar pad muscles, they start to atrophy. All right, you'll have the inability to oppose the thumb to any other finger, okay? And then it will look like this, right? Right here, this musculature here atrophied. This is supposed to be very thick, but it atrophies. So you get wasting of that thenar eminence or the thenar pad. And you now have the inability to oppose the thumb and to touch it to any other finger. That's called opposition, okay? And there's also weakness of flexing the thumb. So they call that ape hand, right? So we did drop hand, we did ape hand. Now claw hand, the C is for claw, the U is for ulnar nerve. This is the inability to adduct or abduct the fingers and you get atrophy 
of the intrinsic muscles between them and you start to get what they call bishop's hand or claw hand. And what that looks like is you get this uh, hyperextension, right? You get this hyperextension here, but you get this flexion here. So it creates a claw, right? Just like this. You get like hyperextension over here. You get hyperextension here, but the fingers themselves are pulled in a flexed position. That's what happens uh, with uh, ulnar nerve palsy. And this can happen um, if you have any compression right here, which is where the ulnar nerve travels down. Maybe you're using a mouse pad too long and your pisiform is being compressed against a hard desk for hours, or you're cycling and you're on a bicycle and you're leaning very hard right around here that can create that uh, claw hand as well. Now, in terms of sensation, sensation to the fingers, the median nerve goes to one, two, three, and half of the fourth finger, right? So the median nerve on the anterior side goes to the first, second, third, and half of the ring finger. And it does the same thing on the posterior side, the first, the second, third, and half of the ring finger, except more of the tips, right? It's the tips on the posterior side, but on the anterior side, it's the whole thing. See the difference? This happens to be where a lot of people feel the symptoms or numbness and tingling of carpal tunnel syndrome. Carpal tunnel syndrome, if it's a true carpal tunnel and there is a pinch right here in that carpal region, the person's going to experience numbness and tingling to the first, second, third, and half of the ring finger. Okay. The ulnar nerve goes to whatever's left, right? The ulnar nerve goes to the other fingers that the median nerve doesn't get. It's the other half of the ring and the fifth digit, front and back, front and back. Okay, the radial nerve goes to the back part only, the dorsal part. It's the mirror image to the median nerve right? Median nerve was first, second, third, and uh, half of the ring on the front. The radial nerve does the first, second, third, half of the ring on the back, but not the full finger, not the full fingers. So let's take a look at this carpal tunnel, right? Because many people experience symptoms in the fingers. Sometimes, sometimes it's carpal tunnel syndrome, but sometimes it's a subluxation in the cervical spine, meaning some sort of nerve impingement in the neck. Because remember, the brachial plexus starts in the neck, through the scalenes, under the clavicle, through the pecs, down the arm, down the forearm, all the way down into the fingers. So this median nerve has origin in the cervical spine. So if someone has symptoms in the fingers, we have to be able to differentiate and say, is the pinch coming from the wrist or is the pinch coming from the neck? We all know that if you step on a dog's tail, the dog is gonna bark at the mouth, but we don't say the dog has a mouth problem. Right, you stepped on the tail. The, the pain is coming all the way from the other end. So sometimes you have a neck pinch that radiates down into the hand. Sometimes you have a pinch in the wrist that goes in the hand. So we have to be able to differentiate. So why is it called carpal tunnel syndrome? Well, there is a carpal tunnel. 
there's a floor of the tunnel. That's the carpal bones. And then there's a roof of the tunnel. And that's the transverse carpal ligament. Sometimes, I don't know if your lab instructor called it the flexor retinaculum, or they called it the volar ligament, but they're all interchangeable in, in their terminology, whether it's the transverse carpal ligament, flexor retinaculum, or volar ligament, it's the same structure. Just authors refer to it as a, a by different names. So in any manner, the transverse carpal ligament or volar ligament or flexor retinaculum is the roof, the carpal bones are the floor, and what's in the middle, that's the actual tunnel. So what travels in that tunnel? The finger flexors, that would be the flexor digitorum superficialis and the flexor digitorum profundus. So that's what these are. But look what else travels through that carpal tunnel, the infamous median nerve, which travels to the first, second, third, and half of the ring finger. The other half and this, remember those are ulnar nerves. What's left, this other half and the pinky is ulnar nerve. This and all of this, that's ulnar nerve, okay? So if it's a carpal tunnel, then what they do is they do a test that's called Phalen's test. And Fallon's test is if you take both of your wrists and you flex them together, Fallon's test is if you hyper flex both of your um, dorsal surface of both wrists, if you hyper flex them against one another and you get shooting pain down the distribution of the median nerve, which is three and a half fingers, meaning it's the first, the second, the third, that's the three, and then half, meaning it's half of the fourth digit. The other positive test is Tinel's sign, which is simply taking your finger or a reflex hammer and banging it over the transverse carpal ligament or banging it over the volar ligament or the flexor retinaculum. If you tap your finger over that and you get lightning or shooting pain to those three and a half fingers, that's a pretty good indication that you have carpal tunnel syndrome. But the gold standard of that is what they call a needle EMG. And a needle EMG is what they do is they take a, a needle and they'll put it on this side, proximal to the carpal tunnel, and then they'll put another needle on this side of the tunnel, right? You got these structures here. So if they put a needle on this side and then another ne needle on the other side and they send a zap, an electric current, they can measure how long it takes to go from needle one to needle two. And just for, for simplicity, if let's say it's supposed to take one second to go from one to two, and it takes three seconds, it's pretty safe to assume that there's some sort of compression in the carpal tunnel. Maybe the trigger is a, a displaced carpal bone, Maybe it's any of these flexor tendons that are hypertrophied or thickened in size because of overuse of the fingers, whether they're typing all day, whether they're a massage therapist using their fingers or all day, whether they're a hairstylist, whether they're a painter, whether they're a contractor, anyone that uses their fingers and their hands all day that can overdevelop these muscles and tendons, if these are thickening, or hypertrophying, if there's hypertrophy of these tendons, then the space 
in the tunnel diminishes and this gets compressed. And that's what carpal tunnel syndrome is. 90% of the time, 90% of the time, when people have symptoms in the hand, it's not carpal tunnel. It's coming from the cervical spine. 